Okay. Um, it's better. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi What we want to do is we want to make this more of an interactive session because we've got lots of lectures online. Mm. People can hear what we have to say. Who will have the first question? Yes, sir. One second. You, you, have, you have to speak up a little bit. So what he's talking about is the difference between, if you like, deism and theism. And I like what uh, Basim Zawadi, I'm not sure if you, he's a friend of yours. He's, he's actually written something pretty good about this. And I'm going to repeat his argument as I know it, or I've understood it, because I think it's a very good link for what you're trying to establish. First of all, you look at the design argument for God's existence. So... There are multiple design arguments for God's existence, but let me just give you an easy one, okay? You look at the universe. The universe is regular, it is stable, and it is uniform. To the extent to which life can exist inside of it. These are uncontroversial statements. If I were to say the universe exists, number one. Number two, the universe exhibits regularity, stability, and uniformity to the extent to which it allows life to exist within it, this is also almost incontrovertible. Not many people would dispute it. Now, the question that is raised is what is the best explanation for the fact that there is regularity and stability and uniformity, the extent to which it can allow life to exist in the universe? That the universe is complicated. It's sophisticated. It has different moving parts inside of it. And that these parts are working in unison to produce this result. What is the best explanation? Is the best explanation intelligence or lack of intelligence? This one question is enough to get the point across, which is the point of an intelligent designer as the explanation or the inference to the best explanation for the state of affairs in the universe. Now, the second part of this is to say, what does this indicate about the entity, which is the intelligent entity, if we accept that this is, in fact, from an intelligence, in addition to the intelligence of this entity, one could say wisdom. Now, one has to define what wisdom is. And in Islamic parlance, al-hikmah, or wisdom, is wad'u shay'i fi makanihi sahih, Or putting something in its rightful place. 
which can also be said to be appropriacy. So if we are able to establish that the entity which is the intelligent entity is intelligent and wise, in other words, that the entity puts things in their right places, the question to then ask would be, is it more appropriate to think that this wise entity created the human being for a purpose or without a purpose? It is a simple question. Nonetheless, it's one that the Quran itself asks. أَفَحَسِبْتُمْ أَنَّمَا خَلَقَنَاكُمْ عَبَثًا وَأَنَّكُمْ إِلَيْنَا لَا تُرْجَعُونَ Do you think we have created you without purpose? And that you will not return to us. This is a rhetorical question that the Quran poses to the people. Because if someone says, yes, the creator, or let's say the intelligent design, the intelligent designer of the, the universe, the wise one, the one which does things for appropriate purposes, has given human being free will, which the human being can detect. But that that free will has no purpose, that doesn't follow from the fact that the entity is wise. Now, one could say it's not a necessary link. I'd say, fine, it's not a necessary link. One doesn't always need to make an argument from necessity in order for an argument to be made. One can make an argument from probability or inference to the best explanation. And that is what I would say. So long as you can affirm the wisdom of the intelligent designer, then it's an easy step to asking a question as to what is my purpose in life? Do I have a purpose or do I not have a purpose? And if you say I don't have a purpose, well, isn't it coincidental that everything in the universe seems to have a significance and could be said to be for the purpose of allowing life to exist, for example, and the maintenance and the providence of the human being, but that the human being themselves have no purpose. So you see, this would seem to be a misstep if someone said that. And most people acknowledge this reality. That's why in the Quran it is posed as a rhetorical question because it is as if the human being knows this already. And of course, we as Muslims believe that the human being does know this already through something called al-fitrah, which is the predisposition to believing in God. So that's how I would answer that question. One of the things you were asking about was a necessary link and he mentioned um, you know the inference is the best explanation so maybe I'll add just a little bit to that just so it's kind of clear what we mean by that and I'll give you I'll do it by way of an example okay so I have a um, I have a second born and he is the most colorful amongst my children if you know what I mean gets into all sorts of stuff now I don't know if you guys have ever had um, you guys have Takis or hot Cheetos you know what that is okay I hate those with a passion. The way that gets on your fingers, it's absolutely infuriating. My second born absolutely loves him. So I want you to imagine now, his name is Abdurrahman, and I tell, I tell Abdurrahman, I said, look, we're having some guests, they're gonna be coming over. And I have bought this huge pack of hot Cheetos or Takis or whatever you guys call it here. I'm gonna put them in the cupboard, do not touch them. So I'm like, you know, he's like, Okay, Baba, no problem, all right? Now, in the back of my head, I'm like, okay, yeah, right. But anyway, so I leave. I come back, and I see my man sitting on the couch or lying down on the couch, passed out. He's got crumbs all over, and the crumbs are going all the way to the cupboard. Now, there are some competing explanations here. My oldest son could have come, knocked him out, set him on the couch, put the Cheetos all the way to the cupboard, and, you know, just wanted to set him up. That's one explanation. Second explanation is that Abdurrahman went, took the Cheetos, ate them, 
ate them to such an extent that he's passed out on the couch. Which explanation do you think would be more likely? The second one, right? That is an example of inference of the best explanation. All right? Just because you don't have a necessity, but you still understand that you make an inference to the best explanation. So it's not necessary to have a necessary explanation. Allahu Alam. All right, let's go for the next question. Maybe we'll get a female questioner so we can try and restore some balance as well. If there isn't any female, then we'll go for... Okay, yes. You can give her the... Yeah, she's going bring it. Um, I've been watching your debates for like four years, so... I'm a really big fan, but Thank you. Um, what I've seen um, throughout, you know, watching what you do, um, I believe that you're a really charismatic and confident person. Yeah, um, keep talking, keep talking. <laughs> <laughs> you speak the truth, my friend, you know? Mashallah. Keep going. Uh, but there are not many people like you in that way. Uh, yeah. It's true, it's true, it's true. <laughs> Please continue That's stroking. That's the inference Please. the best explanation. <laughs> <laughs> Please continue stroking his ego. We, this is what we need. <laughs> Does it ever get lonely for you? Um, wow, that <laughs> took a turn, my man. That took a turn. Do you know, it's a good question. I mean, it sounds like something my psychologist would ask me, the counselor. Or something. I mean, you're <laughs> sitting on a seat. You're sitting on a seat. <laughs> you're ready to go. I'm ready to go. No, honestly, it's a good question. And look, there was one point in my life where I used to work as a secondary school teacher, you know, some time ago, right? And that's when I felt the most lonely of all. Because in that time, you know, I wasn't necessarily making the money off YouTube, which now I'm making a little bit of money off YouTube, all right? So money helps ease the loneliness a little bit, you know. But before that, before that, I was, um, if you like, working in the secondary school, and it was kind of a hostile environment, you know. I remember, because obviously we have traditional Muslim views, I remember having like a three or four hour after school discussion with the deputy head teacher and other people, and they were talking to me about my views on homosexuality, which I'm sure we're going to be covering today here in Lumps, okay, because we need to talk about that here. But you said this, and you said that, and you said this, and you said that, and you said this, and you said that. And there was one point in that meeting where I think even they felt a bit sorry for me. You know, they did. I think the woman was like, you know, I think we've asked them enough questions. And they had all the timestamps ready and stuff like that. And I was like, yeah, this is, this is the belief of the Muslims and this. And then one of them turned around and said, you know, she's saying that's his religious belief. Just leave it as that. But the point is, it's really, it can be lonely, actually, if we're being honest, in situations like that. Now, though, because we work as a group, you know, it's less problematic. You know, alhamdulillah, we've got the group, we've got sapiens, we've got the people, we've got backing, we've got... It, was, it wasn't like that in the beginning, though. In the very beginning, it was like that. Uh, and there are many other stories, but that's just one of them. But now, because I feel like there's a whole fraternity of Muslim people across the globe who have the same kind of views, it's um, less of a lonely experience, but it can be a strenuous one. So that's how I would answer the question. Do you wanna, do you wanna are you lonely, yeah, Fahad? No, alhamdulillah, I'm happily married with five kids. I've, 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 Plenty of people around me. What's that got to do with being lonely or not? You can still be lonely. I, my, my, my mind was going somewhere else, man. I don't know. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyways, all right. Next question. Uh, let's this see. guy here is really excited about it. Look at this one here, please. Yes. But just wait for him to give you the microphone. Just wait. wait for him to give you the microphone, brother. Right the there, microphone. microphone. Yeah. Uh, basically, the question is about you said there are some things that are known to the human beings prior to the experience or by fitrah, as you said. 
So how can we reconcile it to the Quranic verse? Wallahu uh, akhrajakum min butuni ummahatikum la ta'alamuna shayya. So they knew nothing in the start. So how can we say that these a priori uh, intuitive concepts are known prior to the experience of external world? Sure. So la ta'alamuna shayya means they didn't know anything, right? Whereas the fitra is usually described by the theoreticians and others as more of a naza'a than an ilm. And the naza'a means an instinct. So, for example, I mean, Ibn Taymiyyah gives this example. It's quite a good example, and I'll just repeat it. He says that the knowledge of fitra is similar to the knowledge of the baby to suck the breast of the mother. It's not like he has theoretical knowledge of how to do that. I don't know why I just demonstrated it. <laughs> But he just does it, he goes for it, right? Now, what I'm saying is, that's an instinct more than it is a knowledge, like a theoretical knowledge. And likewise, the human being has an instinct to believing in God. So it's not like a theoretical knowledge or cognition or some kind of thing that will be in the, you know, in, in the brain or in the synapses of the human being or something like that. It's more of something that you just feel or do. So it, it can be reconciled if you, depends on your definition of fitrah, that's how it answer. How would you, do you want to add that? No, I mean, so one thing I'll say, I'll do a shameless pitch here. Inshallah, we have a course coming out from uh, Sapiens on the fitra. This is actually one that I've done. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, that's, that's on point. It's basically like an, an in, a type of intuition, right? And the, def, the way we define it in English, because fitra in and of itself, as, even as an Arabic word, is difficult to define bil Arabi. come on. So what, the, way, the working definition we give in English is we call it the original normative disposition. Okay, now I don't want to get into the whole class now, but one part I'll, I'll focus on that is normative. And this is where you get into the difference between, okay, something that you learn, ilm, and so on and so forth, but there's something that is normative, or to translate that, something that is normal. So if you remember the hadith in Sahih Muslim, where the Prophet ﷺ mentions that, ma min mawludin illa yuldu ala fitra. There's no one that is born except upon the fitra. Then his parents make him a Jew, a Christian, or a Magian. The end of that hadith, it talks about the Prophet ﷺ says, just as you see an animal being born, do you detect any defect? Why did the Prophet ﷺ mention that? Because by way of you considering what is normal versus abnormal, if the animal had a defect, you naturally see it, right? And I, you can give many examples of this. If you walk outside and you see people walking upside down, you don't just walk by and say, oh, that's okay. You obviously say, wait a minute, something is wrong. And this is why... And this is why we actually stress understanding the word normative. Because when this is used, and its, it's, it's, it's usage has basically shot up recently, you get a lot of terms which have a negative connotation, right, which we'll probably get into. Like if someone were to ask you, are you heteronormative? Well, that means, do you believe heterosexual relationships are normal? It's a pejorative term in the West, but for us, we, were, we say it proudly, yes, we're heteronormative, right? Are you cisnormative? Do you believe in two genders as opposed to, you know, 50 billion? Well, yes, we say it proudly. But understanding that we consider that normal. Now, getting into an argument about, okay, prove to me rationally there are two genders and this and that, you'll see all the people in the U.S., man, they're trying to go around and around with this, something that just clear as day, male, female, right? So that's all I'll just add. And then, like I said, we have a whole course coming out on that, inshallah. Allahu Akbar. Go back to the sisters. Yeah, I think that's a good balance. Yes, sister. Wait, 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 wait. Just wait for the mic, please. Well, we, we need to get her for the mic, if that's all right. Mom, Sam, after the last. Yeah, okay, I'll, I guess I'll start on that. Bismillah. So, you know, we have, um, we have this service called Lighthouse Mentoring. Right? I know I'm doing a lot of shameless plugs, but, you know, it's, that's what they pay me for. <laughs> Anyways, it's a service called Lighthouse Mentoring, okay? Now, in this service, you can book a free one-hour session with one of our mentors, one of the Sapiens mentors. One of the great things about that is that the question you're asking, what drives people away, we now have data almost three years of data, because we've had all of these conversations with people, 
and we've actually composed a list. What are the main things that drive people away? Now you might think that it would be some sort of like intellectual doubt. And the reality is it's, I would say maybe 90% of the time, and the other mentors could you know, uh, you know, uh, affirm this, it's usually not an intellectual doubt. It's something that seems like an intellectual doubt, but there's something in the backdrop that has led to that person to justify their doubt, right? So if someone says, I don't understand how, you know, let's say the age of Aisha. Okay, when you start to dig, and this is what is beneficial about these sessions, because it's just one hour, you and another person, no cameras, you're not, you don't have an audience, no one's trying to, there's no egos involved, they can open up. And so, you know, this person might say, you know what, I don't really understand the age of Aisha, and you find out that, you know what, it was completely something completely different. As a young person, they were molested, right? But because of that, they had to justify, like, you know, they had a, a, an affiliation of Islam to, with this person that had molested them, he had a long beard, whatever it might be. So my point is, my, what my point is, I wouldn't be able to pin it down on one particular thing, but I can tell you it's overly emphasized that it was going to be intellectual. I would say, not, again, in our experience, three years of data, most people think that it has something to do with some sort of argument that the person has faced, and usually it's not. You know, when you look at the categories of, you know, you have shahwat and shubhat. Most of the times it's some sort of shahwa, right? Before it gets to be a shubha, right? So that's what I would say. And so it depends person to person. We've had people that came on and thought they were homosexual. And it just turns out that uh, it was something completely different. And they actually came out of their belief in, their, in identifying with their SSA, their same-sex attraction, to actually come to Islam, right, properly. So... That's what I can say about that, just data-driven. I don't know if you want to add to that. No, I think he's, I think he's covered it very well, to be honest. All right. I'll let you take the next pick, man. <laughs> uh, do you want to pick someone? I did the last one. <laughs> this guy? Sure. This, this yep. All right. <laughs> Wa alaykum as -salam. First question is that one way uh, Muslims can uh, improve their social status is that uh, the, uh, the world you are doing that raising their voice against Islamophobia. What can be the, uh, the second way that a normal Muslim can do? And my second question uh, is that I um, normally know that hijab is uh, that um. very well. Uh, as for the first question, I mean, things that you could do to get better at pr representing Islam is, I would say, get good at speaking, and that can only be done through practicing, okay? So practice. Speak to your friends, speak to your family, speak to different people. Not everyone has to be a public speaker, though. You can help Islam through other means. Some people are going to be some great technicians, some people are going to be great pilots, some people are going to be great, whatever it may be. So you have to try and find what you're good at. Every young person should be trying to find what they're good at. So this is what I would recommend. Spend time trying to find where your potential lies. As for the second question, I mean, the word hijab in Arabic, it means like barrier. Okay? So in Egypt, I'm originally Egyptian. It's a, it's a common surname, you know. It's not just what the girls wear, but it's <laughs> it's a name. It's a, it's an Egyptian it's an Egyptian name. <laughs> what, can I, what can I say? That's what you say. Yes. Can I, can I add something? Yes. So, what I would just in addition to that, yeah. one of the things is you should understand your context as well. Okay. So, if you are living here in Pakistan, you have certain problems, certain issues that are going to be specifically context related. In other words, specific to Pakistan itself. Right. So. And one of the things that, you know, being here for the few days that I have been here, um, I've noticed that people generally, by and large, and I don't want to generalize the whole nation, obviously, mm. but you find that there is a disconnect between, let's say, how people define corruption versus how people define piety, right? Um, so 
if that's something you recognize, you, make, you can make that your mission. Say, look, you know what? If corruption's an issue here, then maybe that's something I need to work on. So you study for that. You work for that. And the third, and one additional point to that, don't forget about yourself. Because you could be doing all this work, studying for, you know, finding the arguments, finding the resources. If you're not working on yourself, that's going to be very problematic. You look at the da'wah at the, during the Meccan phase. I mean, their tahajjud. I mean, throughout the night, right? There's a reason, there's a hikmah for that. Because there's an understanding that you have to prepare yourself spiritually as well as doing the work. So understand that this is a, a two-pronged approach if you want to look at it this way, right? Understanding your context, understanding where you need to focus, as you were saying, understanding your own talent because Allah has blessed you specifically with something that inshallah you will find beloved and inshallah be easy for you. So your context, your talent, and your own spirituality. How can, and those are questions you can ask yourself. How much Quran do I read in a day? How much tahajjud do I pray? How much do I pray for the ummah? And so on and so forth. And that, part of that is introspection, to be really honest. And that you'll find that that will open doors for you. Open doors for your da'wah. Sah wa Yeah. Wallahu a'lam. So we need one more from the sisters, I think. We're trying to go back and forth. Yeah, let's go. There's a sister here there. So there's four sticks in Islam. There's four like the precautions of Islam. And there's this one stick that I feel like is a really big one I didn't do. And but I feel like if I choose it, it feels as if I'm choosing to do now. If I give me an exa- give me an example of what you're talking about. Um it's superficial but eyebrows. Like there's okay. a common for the thought that says that it's okay for women to do their eyebrows. Right? Okay, fine. So this has been spoken about by scholars of usul al-fiqh, of scholars of these principles of jurisprudence. And I'm going to tell you what Ibn al-Qayyim said about this matter. Okay? He's one of the great scholars of Islam, and he, he deals with this matter directly. So I'll just tell you what he said. He said, say for example, you go to four different people to ask them about a mas'ala fiqhiya, about some issue to do with fiqh, Yes? You go to person one, two, three, and four. Yeah? Now, if in your heart and your mind, you listen to one, two, three, and four, but number one makes the most sense to you, and you go for number two, this is problematic. If, however, number one and number two is like even, you don't know which one is the one. Like, for example, let's just say one, two, and three. So one and two say the same thing, and three says something else. You go with the majority. That's what he says. If one and two say position A, and three and four say position B, then in this situation, you go with whatever's easier for you in your life. And this is because they base that on the fact that the Prophet ﷺ is mentioned about this hadith of Aisha, that he was not told to do two things except that he chose the easier one. But you don't start off by choosing the easier one. You see. You try and do, find, okay, but if you don't know for sure, you could end up going for the easier one. It's a, it's a legitimate Islamic approach. But you don't start with that. You start off with first trying to figure out if you can't figure it out, number two, if you know, for example, that the first scholar is much more knowledgeable than the second scholar, then you go with the more knowledgeable one. But if there's nothing else, and there's two equal opinions, then in that situation, you can go with what's easier. He actually um, compares the situation to a medical case. He says, for example, if you are sick, and you went to Dr. 1 and Dr. 2 and Dr. 3 and they gave you three different opinions, what would you do? He said, treat the matter in exactly the same way as you would treat a medical case because you would be sincere with yourself if you would treat a medical case. 
So if you're going to be sincere yourself with the medical case, you're going to be, you should be as sincere with yourself with the religious situation. Do you understand what I'm saying? So you could go for the easier option. Yeah. Like, but you would only do that after you've really decided, okay. According to Ibn Qayyim, the eyebrows thing would be out of the question because the majority would say it's haram. Some other scholars would say, actually, you know, they'd have more lenient situation. I'm not going to lie to you. Some other scholars are more lenient about that. that. But uh, I'm not going to tell you to do your eyebrows. Yeah. Who? Oh, Ahmed, yeah. Think of him, yeah, sure. Sure. No, the Hanbali Madhab doesn't say you can pluck your eyebrows, by the way. It's, it's the Shafi Madhab. That some of the um, some of the scholars of the Shafi Madhab say this, not the ham, not the Hanbali one. The Hanbali are quite strict about it. In fact, the Hanbali say you should cover your face as a, as a wajib, as a, as an oblig ob obligation. <laughs> so, I mean, um, I would say to you that there is an opinion in Islam that allows this. Uh, you have to follow your conscience. At the end of the day. If you've gone through the process and you still feel like, okay, you know what, I don't know, whatever, then you could choose what's easier. But for me, there's two or three steps before that. If a woman did that, if a woman did that to me, like if a woman did that and she really believed that that opinion was the, was the true one, I wouldn't have any problem with it. Me personally. But that's me because who am I? Like, you know. But I'm saying that it's up to you at the end of the day what you want to choose, Yani, what you think is the, the right approach. But Ibn al-Qayyim would say, choose it in the way that you would choose a medical issue. Because that's when you would be uh, sincere with yourself on it. On it. Thank you. Welcome. Do you want to add to that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, let's go for the, the man at the f far back there with the, with a turban on his head. Yeah. Uh, you need that? I think you need that. Does he need this? Does he need this? No, no, does he need this on his mic? To record for the mic? For the camera? Does he need this? I'm not sure. I don't think so. Okay, why don't you ask? Absolutely, yeah. There is uh, there is a distinction to be made because Allah says in the Quran, "Wala tujadilu ahli al-kitabi illa billati hi ahsan illa ladina zalamu minhum." That do not um, debate the people of the book except with beautiful preaching in a good way, except for the ones who have oppressed among them. So there's always an exception to the rule. That the general rule is, you're you're nice with people, you're you're good with people. But then if there's an exception is when they show you disrespect. Now, for, let me give an example and try and relate this to Pakistani society somehow, right? So, for example, I have noticed that in Pakistani society, in the upper echelons of the society, you have, you know, when I say upper echelons, I'm talking about monetarily, like as a, you know, upper classes financially, right? There's an over-representation of secular, secularists comparative to the rest of the population. And I've noticed some nastiness and some arrogance even from some of those secularists, especially in their dealing with the traditionalist community from within their own socioeconomic group. I'm not sure if this is something you have noticed or not, or if I'm, if I'm, something, if I'm off the mark here. Now, in a situation like that, I think it would be detrimental to be overly nice to such people. Because if they came like, you know, many people are asking questions now, Shubuhat, I want, that's one thing. But if someone comes and tries to question the thawabit or what you call the unambiguous situations in Islam and rulings, using an outside ideology 
whether it's classical liberalism or feminism, or whatever it may be, that has a knowledge production in the West. And they use that knowledge production to try and hammer you over the head with it. Then effectively what they've done is they've voluntarily colonized themselves. But then they are trying to twist your arm to do the same thing. They are suffering from what is referred to as the Gora complex. You see. This is the case. Because I can guarantee you that if you were to ask some of these people at the highest level of Pakistani society who identify as classical liberals or as feminists or as secularists or whatever it may be, to give evidence, rational and philosophical evidence, for their worldview, they would not be able to do so. If I said, what are the philosophical evidences for the second wave feministic proposition that despite anatomical and biological and psychological differences between men and women, that despite those differences that there must be equality in all cases. What's the evidence for that? Just like the brother was asking me, what's the evidence for a personal God or what's an evidence for this? And we said the design argument or whatever it is. What is your equivalent of the design argument for feminism? So they don't have any evidence, I'm sorry to say. There is no evidence because the evidence has been thoroughly repudiated. Thoroughly repudiated. And if you really ask someone for the evidence of classical liberalism or let's say social liberalism, John Stuart Mill himself could not produce an evidence that his contemporaries and his colleagues were satisfied with. And he's the father of social liberalism in the West. Now, if he couldn't do it, and he's one of the most brilliant minds of the West in the Enlightenment period, at the peak of the Enlightenment period, I doubt a Pakistani blind follower <laughs> who attends slums because, <laughs> because he has the money to go here, and then he's smoking a little marijuana and going to a party on the Saturday night, and he attends the LGBTQ community, yes? Because his masters, the white man, have told him to do so. I doubt that that guy can produce something even equivalent to what John Stuart Mill could provide. He would be liberating himself if he had just said, I am just following the white man. They have clean streets and tall buildings. They have a higher GDP. Surely they must be right. I don't have any evidence for what I believe. Yet I am following them because they have cleaner streets and taller buildings. Just be honest and say that's oh, because of Hollywood. I have been impacted by Netflix and Hollywood. I am impressed by the white man. I voluntarily put myself under colonial ideological subjugation of the white man and the white woman. Because let's be honest, feminism wasn't started in Lahore. Don't, pre don't pretend that second wave feminism came from Lahore or Karachi. It's not a, a female emancipation, emancipation project that has its roots in the East. It is a Western knowledge production. And now if you look at, for example, Western feminists, compare the amount of time and energy that they have put into abortion issues and equal pay issues with the amount of energy that they have put into the more fundamental human right of the right of life for women in Palestine, in Kashmir, or Uyghur women, or elsewhere. This shows you without a shadow of a doubt that they don't really care about you as much as you care about them. Ha antum ula'i tuhibbunahum wa la yuhibbunakum. Oh, you, the Quran states this, you love them, but they don't love you. Why do you voluntarily want to be a pajit? And, no, why? The white man is not impressed. He's not impressed, nor does, he, nor does he care about you. If he saw you, the same Pakistani feminist and LGBT advocates, that attend lumps, 
if he saw you on the floor dead, he would have as much care and respect for that image as we have seen he has had for the images of the Palestinian women. So if this is the reality, there is no need. There is no need. There is no need to subjugate yourself in this manner without evidence. Because that which can be asserted without evidence can be rejected without evidence. And that's what this institution and the people of Pakistan need to do next. It's the expunging system. The process of expunging yourself of the ideologies of the West, which are being supplanted in you in order to control you by people who do not care about you. That's the reality of the situation. How do you want to add to that? No, I'm just going to say that um, if you're looking for a way to do that, practical way of doing that, we have a ton of free courses on the Sapiens Institute <laughs> website. I've got to go back to Hamza, yeah, man. I like it. I've got to answer to Hamza, man. <laughs> so they're all free, and we have many courses. One is called No Doubt, you know, how to deal with your and other people's doubts, divine reality, all of these things that we've spoken about. We have a course that came out on secularism. So the details in how to articulate it, like Muhammad Hijab just articulated it, and the ability to tell, let's say, the difference between someone who's going to come and is going to be your enemy and you need to treat them so, and someone that may be coming with a real problem because you need the skill to be able to de decide between the two. That's very important. It's not, it's not a one-size-fits-all, right? You're going to have people, you've got to deal with them directly, to the point, have them understand, as Muhammad mentioned, and there are other people that may be coming with very serious issues. I can tell you now, we have people, Muslims, who are struggling with SSA. Okay, what I, I mean, same sex attraction. These people were sincerely looking for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were looking to come back to Islam. And you know, one of the things that they told me, or one of the things that they mentioned, they said, it is the most loneliest place to be when you're looking for Allah the community, one community is the LGBT community, which has rejected you because you don't fall into their paradigm and don't accept their conditions. And the Muslim community who doesn't accept you because you're having this struggle. It is the loneliest place to be. So you've got to be able to distinguish between that person who sincerely wants to come back to Allah. And many have come back to Allah. Do not let this, oh, this guy, you know, he's, 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 he says he's gay. You know, this person, they said they're transgender. They, we had a person halfway, halfway through transitioning with hormones, with surgery, accepted Islam because they're in a state of depression. Gender, you know, gender dysphoria is very difficult to deal with. And they found Islam right in the middle. So it was difficult. But alhamdulillah, they said it was like I breathe a, a, fresh, a, a fresh breath of existential reality. Right? Just being able to distinguish that. So how do you do that? sapiensinstitute.org <laughs> take our courses inshallah somebody came to me one time before we get to the next question and I'm no psychologist and they said to me and he had a big beard and he, he took me to the side and um, it was in a place called Speaker's Corner in Britain in London and he said I want to speak to you privately so I said no problem sometimes I'm tired sometimes I'm not tired so I was had enough energy to go to the side with him I said what's the problem he said look he looked over his shoulder. He didn't want to, you know, anyone to hear what he was about to say. Look, he said, he goes, I'm not attracted to women. And he had a big beard and everything. So I thought, okay, so, yeah, well, yeah. he goes, so what shall I do? I don't want to get married. I don't want to do any of this stuff. So I didn't know what to say to him. So I started thinking on the spot because I never really counseled anybody in this manner before, right? I said to him, my friend, I said to him, uh, you don't like women at all. He said, he said, no, I don't, I don't, like, I don't like women. I said, all right. I said, uh, do you like coffee? He said, yes, I like coffee. I drink it every day because I can't live without it. I said, how did you feel the first time you had coffee? He goes, I didn't like it. It was very bitter. And then it became an acquired taste. I said, same thing with women. 
<laughs> he didn't believe me yet. <laughs> I said, you know, you just need to get used to the, <laughs> the thing. I said to him, let me explain to you further. And he said, he was now getting interested in saying, okay, well. I said, let me explain to you further. I said to him, what about androgynous women? Like a woman that's like a bit like a man. Like a bodybuilder or something like that. You know? I said, would you feel more or less attracted to her than a normal feminine, say, quote-unquote woman? And he said, no, I would feel more, yeah, he goes, I would feel more attracted. He said this. I said, oh, so it's a matter of extents. So there's a sliding scale of the situation, which means you can start liking this androgynous and then you can move on to this. So I said, if you marry an androgynous woman that looks like a man, what do you think about that? And then he started thinking about the matter. So I said to him, listen, I said to him, if it's possible, that's the first thing you need to do is realize it's possible that you can change your tastes. And there is good evidence to show that you can change your tastes. And that includes food tastes and your sexual tastes. Now, many of the homosexual community, quote unquote, will say, this is a very disrespectful thing you're saying right now. I say, why is it disrespectful? They say, well, because you're saying that they can become, they can come out of the closet and come into the closet and keep, what are you talking about? How can you say this? I said, do you accept, this is my conversation to the homosexual, do you accept that somebody can become from heterosexual to homosexual? Do you accept that they can come out of the closet and that they can slowly change into being homosexual? They said, yes, of course, and we accept such people. I said, so why can't you accept the opposite? No, it's, if that's offensive, this should be offensive. So the point I'm making is sexuality can be quite fluid. And Fahad made a good point, which is that why are we identifying with your sexual pro, uh, proclivity in one time and place? It's a very weird thing. You might realize in your own life that your preferences have changed. For example, I'm not going to say for example, <laughs> but some people, first, they like this ethnicity of man or woman, let's say, and then it changes, and then it changes again. Or they like this age, and then it changes, it changes again. Some people are more radical, they like the man and then the woman, the woman like the man. But what I'm saying is if it's that fluid, if you can change it, if it's possible to change it, and you are suffering from these issues, then all it will take is willpower and time. And so if you realize the possibility of change from a pastoral perspective, then you can affect, inshallah, the change. So yes, there is a way of stopping or stop being homosexual or having this. There is a way of doing it, but it will take time. It's like coffee. Let's go. To I just have no fear. So, I think that's very important from a pastoral uh, perspective, like you mentioned. Keep in mind that this whole concept of conflating desires, action, and identity is not something that is transitory. It hasn't existed forever. It started, again, surprise, surprise, in life experience, right? And it's important, surprise, surprise, it's a, it's a European invention, right? The first categorization. Uh, you know, comes out of Germany. So one of the things that we have to, and this is a point that I can really take home, is that when you are, let's say, counseling someone who's in that situation, try to have to split this concept of I identify who I want to have sex with. And try to connect them to identify with the one who created me, who gave me every single blessing I have, so and so, that if I try to count every single blessing, from my breath to my RB to everything, if you're trying to hear with Allah, not so hard. If you're trying to count the blessings of Allah, you wouldn't be able to count them. To the one that I'm going to return back to, does it not make more sense to identify yourself with the one that created you over the one, over this desire that, like you mentioned, is thing it could change from today, tomorrow, something else. Having them see how superficial it is to identify with the desire just based upon who you want to have sex with 
and seeing how amazing it is, how great it is, how rich with content and, 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 and peace and meaningfulness in life it is by the Bible of the end of the year. Uh, so, shifting the topic a little bit, um, what is your opinion on the Khilafat as a political institution, as viable as an ideal political institution in today's history? How does it fare with relative to democracy, the tradition to kingdoms? Just a little bit. Well, I mean, something which the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi mentioned himself in a hadith, right? And there's a very famous hadith that says that in the beginning there'll be a Khilafat There'll be a caliphate for an environment, and then after that, there'll be a monarchy, and then after that, there'll be a authoritarian regime for the world. And then after that, there'll be a caliphate again. Now, how? Because we are now in the penultimate phase in the history, right? A form of caliphate. Yeah? How will this caliphate look like? I don't know. I don't know how it's going to look like. I don't think anybody in the country knows. You know, it's like, there's a famous book. If you're interested in the science and stuff like that, by Wai al Hala, you know, there's a Christian Arab, but it's as well as one of the impossible say, it's impossible to say. And then they basically he, he attacks the modern nation state and says that this stops like him, which is a sunny, and he attacks on a few different grounds. He makes very powerful arguments. But the truth of the matter is, when the Muslims finally come together, which is a requirement for a far peace among the Soviet Union across the world and, and bullied by the Western powers from time to time. Then, what shape would that take? Would it be some kind of a union to Muslim countries? And then, after that, it would become something else. I mean, that's happened before. For example, there's been groups of Muslim countries that have kind of uh, united in the past, in the, the recent history. So, it's a possibility. But I'm not for sure. How the modern caliphate would look like a court house and stuff. Let's talk about this other time in the future. We look on the truth. Okay, we have to start off with what Muhammad Jinnah, the founder of this state, said, which is Iman, as there's a sort of backwards, there's a lot of over in the Hadd, and it's a Hadd, and the Tanzim, Tanzim. If we do that in Pakistan, then that's one step away from it. Okay, can you hear me? So first of all, huge thank thank you for what you're doing. Um, I've been watching your talk for quite a while. And I'm a clinical psychologist, I have a question for you. Growing up, as you mentioned about Islamophobia, did you personally experience trauma regarding all of that? And if yes, how did you overcome that? And what kind of trauma? Okay. Yeah, I'm not going to go. What kind of trauma? Like, you know, what would you mean? So, for example... It's meant to be like a subject of this in Dagestan. Because it's going to be one of the technicians' thing. Go ahead. Basically, um, I completed my head instead of the flop. Oh, what's that And I was very young. I completed it at the age of 10. And then to... And after that, I wore his job all my life, and I experienced a lot of some kind of part of that. Really? Yes. And um, so I was wondering, I couldn't you do a bit of who you play? Mm -hmm. So I was just wondering, did you go to... Well, I have obvious stuff. Yeah. Uh, not really. Not in London, because London has a big Muslim population. It has 1.5 million Muslims. <laughs> you know? So when it came to Islamophobia, Growing up, I didn't. When I got to an age when I started doing that one, that's when things started to get bad, you know. And, uh, How old were you? I, I was, I think I started doing that one when I was about 24, 25, I think, something like that. So, yeah, I'm 32 now, by the way. I wasn't much older than that. Well, I'm 32 now, so. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I, yeah the song is all like, all you can see. Uh, for example, I was going to a protest. And then a group of people, you know, beat me up and stuff like that. 
Oh yes, I thought it'd be fun. So you should have seen this. <laughs> you should have seen this. It was it was big news. It came on the you know on the news media in the UK and stuff like that. I've had my fair share of encounters in San Diego. I guess I used to work in, in a school that I used to, you know with a few things about like fire as well. You know, so stuff like that. Like, was, and that was I would attribute a lot of this stuff to my activism and to the fact that I'm Muslim. So that came later on. When I showed my cards on the bar that, you know, I wanted to, to help Muslims, Muslims of rights in the you like. Once you represent something like that, then of course you're going to be the subject of attack. And how do you mean that? Yeah, so it's, you learn to deal with that. You know, it's, um, dealing with that is, it's not easy at the beginning when you have a good, you know, support system. I think, you know, to be honest, Credit goes to my mom, man, for that kind of thing. Yes. Because, you know, I was reading this book called The Boy Crisis, and, and Walter Farron, who wrote this book, very good book, by the way, he said something quite about this. So if you have, if a, if a mother gives, like, um, a lot of positive reinforcements to a child, the child grows up to be very mobile. Yeah. So I grew up with my mom. My dad was not really bothered about that that much. Uh, you know, he went to Egypt, you know, all these kind of things, and he, he was not up. But then, because she gave me such a good support system, I feel like that gave me confidence. And so she was probably the number one person that I was to credit for, for that kind of thing. Thank you so much. Because, and uh, the like, all this, the early years are really important to how you develop. So whenever I look at your videos, I've always wonder about your mother. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Love she's she's that. And one more thing is, do you, do you guys in your program that you're posted that you're talking about, do you, do you guys want therapy or community therapy? I haven't seen you guys. Have it's seen. illegal in the UK, isn't it? Okay. Conversion therapy is illegal in most, like, European countries. Yeah, yeah. And what about therapy? Do you guys incorporate that in your coaching program? So in, with Lighthouse and Mentoring, uh, we have an element of that. But we make it very clear that we're not a psychologist or treat a psychiatrist or like that. Our area of focus is specifically with the X, Y, and Z issue. So we look at the groups that we're dealing with. We're talking about ex Muslims, Muslims having doubts, uh, non Muslims. And the fourth category are Muslims that want to know how to deal with these three categories. So our focus is, is very specific. That being said, you realize that we aren't the, um, people that have a background is, you know, psychology and psychiatry. But one of the things that we're very careful about is that, at least in the United States, at least for the UK, um, psychiatry and psychology take a very interesting term. Uh, and it's not a recent term. I mean, just as de like de apologize homosexuality, if you look at the ADA and, and, and how it's, I would say de all, um, if someone needs to be, they need to have a very good, firm grounding on Islamic theological, spiritual principles, and then engage with the Western tradition in such a way that they bring a balance. That's the person we're really trying to bring on board, right? Um, which is a bit difficult because certain things that the Muslim counselors, they can't really happen. In, like you mentioned, the birth therapy, you lose your license for that. Uh, you can lose your license for even telling someone that, look, our religion says that it is haram. To you know, engage in homosexual acts. So, so that's why we we have an element of it, and inshallah we'll be incorporated. But we're looking for the person that has that balance. So, addressing the definition of creed, maybe that is also many of these starting from this idea of the just which was secret house in our Somalia. And many other countries, uh, we don't have any platforms that we have an end of voting. And then, like, so we have to do this. I will say it. The nation's society is not going to do it. It's not going to do it. There's a piece where it said, when you see this, you have to do, uh, like, three things. One is to stop it with the plan of the police. Uh, what are we going to say? And third is a safety. Just, like, maybe you're if you want to be in the prime media, uh, stop him. Maybe I would say we don't have a proper platform, and even like let's say the groups that have been made 
and uh, our south is on the younger folks. Let's see how it are. And it looks like the uh, one who's in it. I will say, sorry to be a pastor here, we're emotional, but I'll find them and what can we do? Because if we join these groups, the Madhulis and a lot of other scholars will say, oh, we the Khawarij. And oh, we so and so can do it. And I will be us. And considering the establishment and going as well in Pakistan, we cannot have, we cannot do anything, right? So, what would your advice be? What can you learn from that? Well, first I'll say, Al Qaeda have never shown any interest in resolving the Palestine issue at all. I mean, they were in next door to Iraq, and instead of going to uh, to Israel, they were fighting other Muslims. So. I definitely would not recommend <laughs> to be with you joining Al Qaeda um, or any of those kind of groups. Uh, Afghanistan, as you know, the Taliban is a government and it could make a decision, but I don't think it's because it's power. The Khan Muslims are not in power in any country in the world today. So these groups do not lead to resistance. I mean, you could say Hamas is the Khan Muslim. Hamas is already a kind of city. They're off kind of a branch of them. And let's say, for example, you wanted to join Hamas. Let me tell you something. They wouldn't accept you. Because they have a very strict selection criteria. And because they have limited weapons, they select their best well-trained soldiers that they've trained themselves. They give them the weapons and stuff like that. So these options are not on the table, unfortunately. Sir, I'd like to add on to the higher mark. Yes. My father is a Jahid in Saudi, in Afghanistan. Sure. Four moment in this. Okay. Like in, he got in the Soviet war. Yes. So he tells me uh, his own soul, and he has practically seen uh, uh, Rosa Bahri and Hussam in that. Okay. But what he says is that they only fought the new Soviets in the beginning, there was no Qaeda, in the beginning, the, the, uh, the main idea of the Qaeda was given by Abdul Azam. And who also gave the idea of Hamas. And I would say that my main question is, like uh, you said, uh, that we cannot join us. And then they have a very strict uh, criteria of who they want to take in the middle of the country. Yeah. How would you go there in the first place? Uh, yeah. I'm not asking that question. Yeah. My question is that, for example, here in Pakistan, what can we do? Okay, honestly, what can you do? You can change the public opinion. Because if I, look, I think that if, if, if really this is going to be done, it has to be done by the territorial arms. It can't be done by groups, it has to be done by territorial arms. So it would be Pakistan that would have to make a decision with its sixth most powerful army in the world. This is because you're not fighting uh, Israel. Israel is allied with the United States of America. That's where the trouble is. And so Pakistan, in order to make that decision, it would have to be probably allied with something like Russia or China. It would have to have some backing elsewhere. So it's not as easy as on this is. The best thing you can do, you were talking about donations. We, for example, recently we had like fundraiser in England, and we raised over one million sterling pounds for the people of Gaza. Now, we know that 15,000 pounds is all it takes for one ambulance to go inside the car. We have these videos, and I've put some of them up on my social media, of the ambulances going in and feeding and saving the lives of the children in Gaza. They were allowed to go in, they give them the food, and they save their lives. Because the Quran says, Whoever saves a life, it's like saving everyone. Because there's two aspects of this. Well, if you have a choice, to kill an Israeli soldier, which I think everyone would like to do. Okay. He's right here, yeah, shoot him and so, the bastard. So, so. <laughs> or option number two is to save a, a child's life, a Palestinian child. They will both be if you have to shoot him or you have to save him. Which one would you do? Save. You'd save. This option is available to you. This Obviously, you can do both, that's fantastic, but that's not available to you. 
if that was, if this one was available on this we would do both, no problem. But if only one of them is available, which is saving this one, you can't save the life. Because it's not just the missiles that kill the children. It's, it's malnourishment, it's, it's a disease, it's all these things. So when I saw those ambulances going inside, and then they videoed the children getting the food and the drinks, and they were eating it, and, the, and you could see it was affecting their health immediately. Then I realized there's a lot we can actually do. Boycotting is, well, like if we're being honest about the situation, it's easy to talk about fighting all this kind of stuff, but you're very far away from the prospect of it. But the same person who's speaking about fighting, he goes and gets some McDonald's or this and that, and he eats and he says, well, one, one, one burger won't hurt anybody. Okay, well, if you, could, if you really felt strictly about this, you should have been boycotting the matter. You should have been raising money in charity. How much money have you raised in charity? How much have you went to your friends and said you want to go to this? How many posts have you shared? Like, the things that are in your control, how much of it have we actually done? Because if we talk about the thing which you know and I know, you don't have access to, then it's lip service at that point. But if we, there are lots of things you can actually do. Raising awareness of the issue. And so on and so forth. So my point is, let's be productive. Because when we talk about the things which are not, which are the decisions of politicians, then it's, it, we've come out of the scope of productivity and we've gone to the realms of imagination. That you imagine? Yeah, look, um, one way to kind of think about it as well, you know, it's really difficult to be in a situation where you feel like you lost, right? But this is not a new situation, right? We had all them. We had all them. But then, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, Surah Imran, that, you know, right? So you, you know, you're, you're feeling bad that they injured you, but they were also injured, right? And Allah then follows that and says, that these days are alternating, right? Some days you win, some days you lose. So that Allah will make known the believers. So really, and this is one thing that I would say, like to test yourself as a point of introspection, is like Muhammad was mentioning, what have you done up to this point? I mean, I'm telling you now, you would think sharing a social media post is something very minor. Especially when you think the grandeur of going to war, fighting, and, you know, it's just, it's, it sounds like something very minor. But the type of effect it's having, I can tell you now, coming from the United States, we are changing people's minds. People are becoming Muslim because of those posts, man. Every single, like, we, before Gaza started, in our masjid, we want to get, you know, uh, shahadas every Friday. Now we're getting one, two. Why? We see the people of Gaza. We see people sharing the posts. People like you. And they see that. They say, where do these people get their resilience from? And we want to know where. And we want that for ourselves. Because as strong as the West looks and the United States looks, internally, they're going through some major culture wars. This LGBTQ issue, all of these other issues, it's tearing them apart. And they're looking for some sort of solace. And when you have that sort of power, you have more power in your hands than you really think. Just with the, with the touch of a button, sharing those videos. Because that is influencing people on the other side of the world <laughs> that you might not even know. Imagine you show up on the Day of Judgment. Not only have you contributed to, you know, feeding someone from Gaza, helping the people of Gaza, but you're bringing people to the sound of the process. I saw a video the other day, an Israeli soldier himself became Muslim. I mean, it's crazy, right? We need Israeli soldier. You know, just it, it reminds me of this one, uh, this one brother who was having trouble getting up from Fajr. I know this is an aggression, but I just, I just remind me of it. He's having trouble getting up from Fajr. There's this clock you can buy in the, in the U.S. And the way it works is, is that, it, you know, when you want to hit the snooze button, it'll automatically donate a certain, to a certain cause. So <laughs> what he did was, he set the cause to donate a thousand dollars to the IDF every time he snooze button. So, he never missed Fajr. 
I think technology is confusing that one. Okay? <laughs> no, I just right? <laughs> my point is, my point is, you have more power than you think. The grandeur of like, you know, it's, it seems very attractive. Like you are making a difference, man. Right? Don't belittle the actions that you're doing. Don't, because we're on that side of the world. We're seeing results that you can never imagine. People are out there protesting and they're, you're changing people's minds. You have a guy like, you know, Tucker Carlson, who's not coming over. You have many of the conservative Republicans that they're being split on this issue. Why are we sending our money abroad? This is pointless. You're changing people's minds. And Allah knows best where that victory is going to come from. Whether it comes from armies that are going in, okay, fine. Or it comes from people in the United States coming back. They become Muslim. How amazing would that be? You've increased your brothers and sisters in a place you'd never imagined. Remember when Umar ibn Khattab was about, you know, had some sort of sympathy for some, for, 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 for the Muslims when they were leaving. And one of the, one of the, one of the Sahabiyah thought that, okay, well, you know, he's, he seems like she's, she has, she said, you know, she, she thought that, okay, there was something in him. This is when he was torturing the Muslims. And, you know, her husband said, where he said, look, you think Umar is going to be Muslim? Let me tell you something. My donkey will be a Muslim before he becomes Muslim. Right? So, we have to really now kind of expand our horizons, think outside the box, and don't feel disempowered. You are very empowered because you have something that they don't have. And you have La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. That is way more power than anyone in the West has except the Muslims.